saying thanks. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to spend some time here, even though this is a short visit, just 10 days. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, but I'm, I'm very glad to be able to interact with all, with all of you. And also to give this talk and thanks, thanks for, the, for the introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about language use in humans uh, and machines. And so basically what I'm interested in is language, right? So natural language, the language that, uh, that we use to communicate with each other. So I think that this is a fascinating ability that we have, fascinating skill that allows us to exchange ideas, to socialize, and also to coordinate in achieving things together by communication. And so my field of research is computational linguistics. You may also be familiar with the term natural language processing, right? It has become also very popular. Um, both of them are almost interchangeable, but I do have a bit of a preference for the term computational linguistics because I think that it makes very explicit the interdisciplinarity that is part of this field, right? So the fact that there are different fields that kind of come together in computational linguistics. And the things that I'm interested in have to do with understanding better how human language works. That has to do with linguistics, psycholinguistics, cognitive science, by using computational methods that often comes from, well, most of the time come from machine learning, from, from AI, from computer science, and so on. And at the same time, thinking about how uh, ideas from linguistics and psycholinguistics can inform the development of NLP models, of natural language processing models. Okay. So these are the kind of questions that, I, that I'm interested in and that will be part of, uh, of what I will be talking in this, in this talk today. In the last few years, as you may know, the field of NLP, computational linguistics, has been revolutionized by, by, many, by many ideas, right? Particularly in the last year. So actually today it is the anniversary of the launching of ChatGPT. So some of you may know the 30th of November, a year ago, it was when it was made public. So it's been a rather crazy year for computational linguists. Suddenly all our research and all the things that we do were in the public domain and we had to kind of figure out how to respond to this, how to talk to the public, etc. Things for, for which we have not necessarily been trained. Right? So it's been exciting, also, yeah, a bit exhausting, but exciting, definitely. And so in the last few years, not only in the last year, but in the last few years, um, the research that is being done in, in NLP, in computational linguistics, uh, has been powered, has been driven by what has become called foundation models, right? Mostly you will know large language models, but uh, Stanford University coined this term of uh, foundation models. And this is just a kind of uh, an extension. So this just refers to very large machine learning models that are implemented as artificial neural networks. Nowadays, using this kind of transform architecture, a complex, very powerful type of architecture with lots of attentions here and there. And, uh, and this is a key methodology that now is used all across the board for developing language technologies, but also for doing research within computational linguistics and also from a more cognitive perspective sometimes, right? And yes, yeah, so foundation model is like a, a, a generalization term. It does not refer only to language-based models, but it all started really with large language models, right? So foundation model is just has the, the same type of mechanisms as a, as a large language model, but does not necessarily have to do with language, right? That's why it's a generalization. But it all started with uh, this type of models, it, this type of transformer-based deep learning architectures being applied to language, and that's the, the large language models. So here's the overview of what I want to talk about. I want to, in the first part of the, um, of the, of the talk, I will be focusing on this type of foundation models, large language models. These are foundation models that are trained only on text. And as I said, we're the first of the, of the, the first type of foundation models. And I want to explore two questions, whether, uh, whether we can use ideas from human language processing to evaluate the generation capabilities of these models. This will become clear a bit later. And also we, whether we can use these large language models to quantify a human processing effort, which is a notion that is very important in psycholinguistics, the idea that uh, it takes effort to process language. And then in the last part of the talk, I will look at models 
that have to do with not only language, but actually that have been trained with other modalities, in particular language and vision, language and images. Right? So sometimes these are called multimodal foundation models or just multimodal models. So they go beyond uh, just large language models that are trained only on text. And here the questions that I will be asking is are whether whether the knowledge that the that these models that in principle have more information than just large language models, whether this knowledge is aligned with human linguistic intuitions. And then in the end, I will just give you some ideas of some work in progress, some stuff that we are working on now, uh, which has to do with figuring out whether these uh, multimodal models can also help us to understand what's going on in the human brain when we are processing input that uh, that comes from different modalities on the vision and the linguistic modalities all right so that's the plan if you have questions in the meantime then please just ask me and i will just go on like this so first let's start just by taking a look at the basics of large language models so just at the mechanisms that are the, the very basic mechanisms behind behind language models so large language models are trained on tons of text right so on very very large amounts of text that come from the from the uh available that are available free on the internet and whatever you can grab basically all right so they have all this training data this consists of text this consists of sentences etc everything you can grab so a possible sentence in this training set for a language model a training example maybe just a sentence like this right many many commuters travel by tram Okay, so we have a training, a training sample, a training sentence like that. Then we mask a particular word, for example, the last word in this sentence, right? And then we let the model predict what word this may be. Right? The model knows all the vocabulary of English, if this is an English-only model, right? So it knows what are all the words in English, and this would be all the words that appear in the training set, for example, all the type of words that appear in the training set, right? So now we ask the model, okay, among all these words that you know, which one is the one that appears in this sentence? So then the model assigns a probability to each of the words that it knows, a probability to each of the words in the vocabulary. And this probability at the beginning is going to be very off because the model doesn't know much, right? So it's processing the corpus, et cetera. And at the beginning, it will be quite random, this probability. But then once the model assigns a probability to each of the words in the vocabulary, then the actual word in this particular training example is revealed right and therefore we have a target distribution that should have applied to this example so the word tram was here the actual word it should have received a very high probability right and this gives us a training signal from the model for the model right so uh the the training is the the training sample is revealed and now we know how we need to update the model parameters. So we need to increase the probability that the model assigns to, assigns to Trump in this context, and then decrease the probability of all the other words, right? So this is the basic mechanism. Now, if you do that many, many times, right? Millions of times and so on, then the model is eventually going to learn to predict the right probabilities of what is coming next, given a context very well, okay? So it will do, it will learn very well, and it will learn Things like, for example, the fact that in this context, after the word by, there are many words in English that actually are not really plausible co continuations, right? So words like yellow, speak, window off, and many other English words would not fit very well here. The model will learn this very well. And it will also learn that there are certain classes of words that have some things in common that would be plausible continuations in this context. All right. So of course, this is much more complex than this. The models have many layers, right? They are very deep. So these predictions are done at different layers. There are lots of computations going on, but essentially the core mechanism has to do with, uh, with this kind of prediction. So through this sort of learning and through the, the complex architecture and so on, and through the, the sheer amount of data and the complex number of parameters and so on, these models are really able to learn a lot of knowledge about language and um, as a byproduct also quite some knowledge about the world that is present in the text that they are trained on right and in addition they also can be used as models to generate language like you very well known if you have interacted with chat gpt or other types of generative ai models 
right? So we can not only use to make these kind of predictions, but actually to generate language. So really predicting one word at a time and one sentence at a time and so on, right? They can use to generate language. All right, so a very key problem within the natural language processing community and so on is how we should evaluate these large language models. It's actually very difficult. I mean, in general, to evaluate the generation of language, so NLG, that's natural language generation, a subfield of natural language processing, is a, is a field that has been very concerned with evaluation because it is really very difficult to evaluate um, the, the goodness, how fitting a certain gener generated text it is, because there are so many dimensions that one could consider, right? Is it good with respect to fitting the context? Is it actually uh, fluent, for example, right? This is appropriate in terms of style. So there are so many dimensions on how you can evaluate text. So this is a complicated, it's definitely very difficult to evaluate the generative capability of, uh, of large language models. So a proposal that I want to make is to try to evaluate, not as the only method, but as an additional method, okay? To evaluate large language models through the lens of human production variability. I'll tell you in a moment what I mean by that, right? And what I want to investigate is whether language models, large language models, LLMs, are able to reproduce the variability that we observe in human language use, all right? So what do I mean by human production variability? So when we speak, when we use language, when we talk to each other and so on, um, in any given context, in any given communicative situation, if we're in the middle of a conversation, we may be able to continue by saying quite a few things, right? So typically, particularly if we're in a dialogue, we are not so restricted to only be able to express one idea, right? We can continue in many different ways. So for example, if we have this conversation here, can you help me please? Sure, if I can, I want to send this small parcel to Canada. There are quite a few things that could continue in this conversation that could go on in this conversation. For example, the, the, this adversary could respond by saying, so what do you want me to do? Or another possibility to whom? It takes 10 to 14 working days to, to reach and so on, right? There are five possibilities that actually were proposed by five different speakers in this case, okay? And it's clear that there is this variability. What can be said in this context can vary to some extent, right? Now, this is not the case for all communicative situations. So dialogue is one of these conversation, is one of these situations, maybe the most common in which we use language, where the variability is very large, right? So we have a lot of possibilities at our disposal. This is not the case in every communicative situation where we use language, right? So for example, imagine that we are in a situation where we need to translate a language. So the communicative situation is such that what has to be said is clear because you have it in one language and you just need to translate it into another language. So the variability of what I'm calling here intent, right? The variability of what to say is very constrained in a, in a translation communicative situation, right? But even when the context, in this case, the sentence of a given language constrains what to say, there can be a lot of variability about how to say it, right? So the possible realizations how we, the words that we choose for how we say something, so, right, beyond what we, what we say, how we say it, can also vary quite a bit. That's one of the beauties of language that we can actually express the same things in so many different ways. So for instance, consider this, this translation um, scenario. We have this sentence in English, several companies have that thus far reacted cautiously when it comes to hiring, and five possible translations into German. And you will see here, if you know English and German, German is quite bad. So you will see that the phrase several companies can be expressed in different ways uh, in German. And here, some of them are the same, some of them are different, right? And the same for the phrase reacted cautiously. Uh, it doesn't have to be expressed in the same way all the, all the time, right? So here, the intent, what is being said is constrained, but how we say it, there can be quite some variability. Okay, so there is this kind of variability in, in human language production, right? Now, this variation or variability is also present in uh, LLMs. Often we talk about 
this variation or variability in terms of the uncertainty of the model, how uncertain the model is in what the model can generate, right? So basically an LLM considered as a text generator is a probability distribution over productions, that is over sequences of words or over sentences, given a certain context, like a prompt that you give to your language model, we are given a context, then the model just specifies it's just a probability distribution over possible sequences that can come next. Okay, so if we look at it in this slide, then we can ask the question that I was mentioning before, right? So is this generation potential or sometimes we refer to this as representation of uncertainty but there is no need to use these words right is this generation potential of the llm in compliance similar to human production variability that we see in human language use this is what i want to investigate and use it as a dimension for evaluating how good the the, the language model is now you may ask me okay why should we care why is this a good criterion at all right and so what do you think? Is this a meaningful question to ask? Does it make sense that an LLM reproduces to some, in some way or other this variation, this, this potential for flexibility or whatever you want to call it of, the, of, of human language use? What do you think? Hello. Whoa, cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was saying you could think about using, um, you know, if they do, if it does generate the same kind of variability, this could be very useful for various chatbots that are used in healthcare, for example. So a lot of people are trying to use them for like mental health care triaging um, and or even mental health counseling, like an AI therapist, if you will. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, depending on the context and the right. So maybe so. Uh, if I understand you correctly, even if we match the level of variation in this probability distribution, there are many things that we will not solve. And I completely agree. Right. Also, so I think that well, I think that they are compatible. These two answers, right? So I think that I. Uh, for me, like you were saying, there is value in trying to get this kind of match because we want to use these technologies to speak with humans, right? To interact with humans. So it seems to make sense to let to that they have very similar capabilities, so that also the expectations of the humans somehow uh, match what the model is going to produce, right? But uh, but just by by checking or by by enforcing or by having this as a as a desideratum, we are not going to solve everything. We are not going to add intents to the model, right? So of course, there is a lot more work to do to, to create a, a conversational agent that is actually natural in an actual conversational partner. OK, yeah, I added this here because as you see, the kind of questions that I'm asking are driven uh, start from the assumption that I think this makes sense, that this kind of question makes sense. But that's not always the case, right? So and in some situations in AI, there might not be value in trying to devise um, AI systems that actually behave like humans, because maybe other type of behavior is more effective for a given task, right? So some machines, I mean, machines may do tasks better than, than we do. And in some situations, that's what we want, right? We don't want to reproduce how humans do things, but do things better. But when it comes to language, particularly if the point is to have machines interacting with humans, then I think that this makes a lot of sense, this kind of perspective. Okay. All right, so yeah, let me go. Oops. Okay, so we are here. All right, so we are going to try to figure out this question here. And so 
we want to kind of compare, right? So the, the model generation potential to the variability of, uh, of human language use, right? Now, we cannot compare directly this probability distribution to the, to the human population because we don't have access to the whole human population and we don't have access to the whole probability distribution. But what we can do is that we can sample from these two processes, the human process and from the LLM process. So given a context that is fixed, that will come from an actual uh, human context, human language use, then we can use our LLM to sample a set of productions, a set of possible continuations. And we can do this, the same with a set of humans, right? So in fact, the dialogue that I showed you at the beginning, as I said, were these were continuations that were produced by several uh, human participants. So we are kind of sampling from the human population as well. So now imagine that for each context, we have this set of samples, one automatically generated by the LLM and another one generated by, by humans. Um, and then what we're gonna do is to check the, the to, to measure the variability in these sets, in each of these sets independently. So we are going to define some measure, some pairwise measure, and we are going to measure the variability within all the automatically generated productions and all the human generated productions. We can define different types of measures. For example, some possibilities could be semantic variability. If we have a, a kind of vector representation and embedding representation of each of the sentences, then we could check cosine similarity between the sentences. That's a measure of semantic variability of how similar the meaning of these productions are. And there are other possibilities, right? We could also measure lexical variability. So the, the degree of word overlap for example, right? That this has to do more with how things are expressed, um, the degree of, of overlap. And other measures are possible as well that are more syntactic, for example, how structurally similar or different these things are and, and, others, and others as well, right? Okay, so we are going to measure the variability in the automatically generated set and the human set. And then what we are gonna do is just compare, measure the distance between these two sets of, uh, of distances of, of variabilities. Okay, here you just have an example of, uh, just to exemplify what we are doing, an example of another dialogue context, right? Dialogue, it's very dark in here. Will you turn on the light? Next turn, okay, but our baby has fallen asleep. Then turn on the lamp, please. But where's the switch? And then you can see five possibilities generated by humans, and then five possibility or more, 10, 10 possibilities generated by this LLM uh, dialogue GPT. And see a little bit of the, the style and I will not read them all, but uh, some of them make more sense than, than others and so on. So here, for example, it's very visible that the length is quite, is quite different, but I'm not gonna focus on length, right? So the, the, the human ones are longer, the other ones are shorter, but that's not something that holds for all LLMs at all. So, so that doesn't matter. Okay, but I hope the method is, the method is clear, right? So, so then we are gonna compare this, these two things. All right, so let's, let's see what happens. First, we can use this just to check um, human production variability, right? So we just have our samples from the human process, and then we can just do this pairwise measurement uh, and check how much variability there is in the human language use. I'm just gonna show it here for semantic variability. So we are checking word embeddings of the production of the human productions. And we are looking here at uh, four different communicative communicative situations. One is dialogue, like the examples that I have been showing. The other one is translation that I've also shown you some examples before. And then there are two other tasks. One is simplification, that is text simplification. So given a certain text, a few sentences, then give me a simplified version of that text, simplify this text, right? This is useful for, for many, in many situations if you want to create a text that is more appropriate for certain age groups, or for example, for non-native speakers, right? So the context is the original text, and then we generate a simplified text. And then there is also story generation. So here the prompt is the beginning of a story, and the generation task is to provide the continuation of this story. So it has to have some plot, et cetera, whatever. You, there are no, no very concrete instructions, just a story generation. So what we can see in this plot is that the amount of semantic variability in these communicative situations when we are talking about human uh, languages is quite different, right? And it goes according to the intuitions that I think we would have, right? So for 
dialogue and also for story generation, there is a lot of variability because these are communicative situations where we have a lot of freedom with how we can continue. Right? So what can be said is very open. So we call them sometimes open-ended tasks. So While the other two tasks- how, how did you quantify the variability here? Uh, this is semantic variability. So we extracted sentence embeddings for each of the continuations, and then we computed cosine distance. So it's a measure of pairwise or? Pairwise, yes. Among that uh, response to the same uh, query. Yeah, with the same context. The context is always fixed, and then there is a set of productions after this context. Question. So uh, all the time this one has a uh, unimodal distribution for each case? Um, yeah, actually, yes, because for the other measures that we looked, they are also unimodal, yeah. Yeah, so this, we are only looking at human language here, right? But it's super interesting in my opinion. Also, I didn't want to bother you with more information, but when you look at the different types of similarity distance measures, semantic, lexic, syntactic, so to see how this varies across different communicative tasks is pretty interesting, I think. So, yeah, so we can see here that for translation and for simplification, we, where what has to be said is determined by the context, right? So we have the, the sentence in the original language or the original text that determines what needs to be said. So this is much, much more constrained than the variability of, the, of how, to, how to respond, how to generate is much, uh, much smaller, right? So there is, there, is, uh, there is not a lot of distance of semantic distance. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is what we see in the human processes, in the human language processing. So now the question is, do our neural text generators, our LLMs, reproduce this kind of human variability? So I will not show you a plot like this one, but I will show you, well, because we now what we are looking is, we are measuring the, the statistical difference between the two sets of variabilities, right? So this plot is showing you, showing you the results for each of the different tasks, dialogue, story generation, simplification, and translation. Yeah, sorry that I realized here that the colors don't match, but I hope that you can still decipher it, right? So basically, when things are aligned along the zero the, in the middle, this means that the match is very good. So there is not a lot of divergence between the two types of distributions, right? And I think that in general, it's quite a line in the middle. So mostly what stands out here is that for translation, the variability tends to be underestimated which is interesting because for humans, this is also where the variability is less. So when we use an LLM, actually it is even less varied, right? So uh, uh, it will it will just uh, converge more on on a very few on very few um, possibilities, right? And we can see also here that for dialogue, it's quite well aligned on the zero, but perhaps it overestimates a little bit the amount of variability. So it can even so it can go a little bit off the rails in the responses. Perhaps this is also what you saw in the examples of dialogue GPT that I showed you before. But I would say that overall, um, this is not so bad, right? So that overall LLMs, because we are here just evaluating a set of LLMs. I didn't even tell you which ones, right? But overall, some LLMs approximate human production variability relatively well with some overestimation some underestimation but it's not bad it's relatively good right i'm curious about like if you asked humans to now rate the mm -hmm. what was generated by the um you know by the llm mm -hmm. for, for kind of like the subjective quality of their response um because for example if like if I were to just rate, I guess subjectively, like the quality of the you know GPT's response. Yes, I feel like they they wouldn't be that. I wouldn't rate them that high. Okay, yeah, because yeah. of course, because quality. That's what it's. There are so many dimensions towards quality and what's a, a, a suitable generated text, right? So yeah, so these only only taps on a particular dimension, right? So any additional evaluation on top of it, of course, would be very valuable. So to understand whether, yeah, this, this variation uh, also correlates with quality at other, at other levels or not, right? So 
so yeah, see, so we should not read more than what this is, right? So it's really just quantifying this variability. Other things might still be pretty bad. So this variability on the human side is across many people, right? Yes. So, and then this machine is from a one program. Yeah. So then that one issue is that like a sequential consistency. If I talk like myself in one sentence and the other person in another sentence and that's totally some people, uh, the third sentence is uh, totally strange, right? Yeah, that's true. But yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a very, a very good point, right? So we are treating the LLM as, uh, as, as equivalent to a human population. Yes. Yes, but you would hope that if it is used in a conversation, then that the turn by turn context of the conversation is constraining things in a way that you still get at least the illusion that you're talking to a coherent agent, but obviously we know that this is sometimes not the case. So there are also quite some people trying to work on this consistency by creating personas and so on. So restricting the behavior of the LLM. But yeah, but it's a good point. We are treating the LLM as a population. All right, so yeah, so this is, this is not to say LLMs are great in what they generate. It's just that they seem to match human production variability relatively well. Right. Okay, so given this somewhat positive result, now I want to go it further into this kind of cognitive investigations and then say, okay, so can you now investigate, uh, use them also to investigate other more classic, well, I don't know, classic, but yeah, other more classic psycholinguistic questions. Right? So given that this result seems to be on the positive side. And so one fundamental uh, notion in, in psycholinguistics has to do with quantifying processing effort, human processing effort, when, when uh, humans are using language. Right? So using language is actually effortful. It, it involves some kind of cognitive effort, both producing language and also comprehending it. And the idea is that when we use language in conversation to communicate with each other, that both speakers and addressees, so in a dialogue we exchange these roles, speakers and addressees, balance this effort in a kind of collaborative way. Right? So dialogue is a kind of collaborative, uh, collaborative activity, and speakers and addressees should balance, presumably do balance this effort. Right? So the addressees, those that are in the comprehension mode in a dialogue, act, are assumed to actively predict what is going to be said next, right? This prediction means uh, doing some effort, right? And speakers, when we decide what we are gonna say and how we are gonna say it, when we, when we plan these, uh, these aspects, right? Then we presumably take into account the processing effort on the side of the addressee, right? So the decisions that the speaker makes take into account the processing effort. So this idea of, of effort is very central to how we use language and how we process language, both from the production side and from the comprehension side. Okay. So there's been quite some work on how we can quantify this effort. And as you can see here, there is also like a sort of equivalence between predictability, what is being, pre how predictable something, pre predictable something is, and the effort that this involves. So things that are very predictable are supposed to be less effortful and things that are very surprising that are not easily predictable, then are supposed to, to incur quite a lot of cognitive effort. Right? So we want some ways of quantifying this effort for better understanding how we collaboratively manage this effort in conversation. How can we capture it? There are some established methods in psycholinguistics, maybe some of you are, are familiar with them, right? that come from information theory and that have to do with quantifying the information content or called also surprisal. Uh, of words in context, right? So this surprisal measures the probability of a particular word in context. And then you have to figure out how you compute this probability. But that, that's one idea, right? That's what has been used across the board. There are different um, issues with surprisal. I cannot go over them all, right? But for example, it's computed at the word level. So it's uh, any extensions to other, bigger units, like for instance, dialogue acts or other things in dialogue uh, are a little bit tricky and it has other problems. So basically, even though it's a very useful notion, I think that there is quite some scope for trying to develop other notions to quantify effort that could be perhaps complementary to surprisal. So a new proposal that, that we are presenting is to quantify utterance predictability, that is the effort that it takes to predict something, um, as 
uh, distance from possible alternatives. So given a context, something has been said, how effortful is to process that? So we are going to operationalize this as how distant this is, this is from all the possible things that plausibly can could have been said in that context. And uh, this, this, uh, this, this um, proposed measure that we call information value um, can, be, can, can be formulated by exploiting the generative uh, capability of LLMs. So what we are proposing is that we can use the generative capability of LLMs to, uh, to operationalize this type of measure of effort. So let's see how we can do it. So this is, uh, we call it information value instead of surprisal. And it is a measure of utterance predictability as a distance from possible alternatives, from possible uh, alternatives. So we have a context as before, a possible dialogue context. I ate a pizza the other day. So what do you feel like eating today? How about some burgers? And then there is a next utterance, a next turn. I already had a burger yesterday. And basically what we want to quantify is how effortful it will be for speaker A to integrate this, right? To predict that this is coming in the dialogue. And so what we are assuming is that somehow a set of possible alternatives is being taken into account. And the predictability of this, of this utterance, of this next utterance I is defined as how distant this next utterance is from this set of possible alternatives that define what is plausible in this context. All right. Yep. Why is the particular uh, utterance? Yeah. Yes. I, so in this case, we know which which it is, and we want to quantify how effortful, how predictable it is in this context. The X is a sequence of uh, interaction before, and what is A sub X? Yeah, so A here is the alternative set, the set of possible alternatives that are not Y of possible things that could have been set in this context. And that's what we call it the alternative set. And now the question, so this is a very, a very abstract view of what I'm telling you here, right? Now the question is, how do we get this alternative set, right? So this is what's in our data. How, how do we get this alternative set? And the proposal is that we are going to use LLMs to generate this alternative set. Okay. So we use LLMs to generate this set like we did before with the sampling from the LLM. We give it the context, and then we generate a set of possible continuations. So now we have the alternative set generated by the LLM, the actual utterance for which we want to calculate predictability, we want to calculate effort, and we can apply the distance measures that I told you about before, like semantics uh, distance, for example, or lexical distance or syntactic distance and so on. Right? And the idea is that if the, the distance is, is less, then that's more predictable. If the distance is more, then that will be more surprising. Okay, that's what the well, that's what the model states, what the theory states. Okay, so how do we check whether this works? How do we check whether this method has any? It's cognitively plausible, right? So does it work to do things like this? Are we actually computing effort, computing human processing effort with this kind of methods where we generate this set with LLMs? So what we can do to test this is to see whether when we calculate effort predictability in this manner whether this correlates with uh, psychometric data, right? Like for example, data that comes from humans reading text. So if you have uh, humans reading text and you are tracking the, their eye movements using an eye tracker, then this gives you a notion of effort because when we read, we don't look at the words for the same amount of time or at all words for the same amount of time. So if words are very predictable, we actually tend to skip them when we read. We don't even look at them, right? When words are more surprising or when utterances are more surprising, then we spend more time fixating on the words. So it is well known that reading times uh, gives you a lot of information on what is effortful when processing. So we can see whether our estimates calculated with this alternative set and so on actually correlate with reading times. And there is also other type of data, acceptability judgments, so you may, uh, there are some data sets like this that have asked uh, uh, humans to rate how acceptable 
uh, uh, the given continuation is, right? Uh, this is graded, it's not just binary, it's acceptable, not acceptable, it's uh, graded through a scale, right? So we can also check whether our estimates correlate with this type of acceptability judgment, right? So this will tell us whether the method works reasonably well. Okay, so does it work then? So here we have the correlations, and we were quite pleased with the results that we got because we did obtain significant correlations with these things. So you see the first two are um, uh, data sets of dialogue, of, of conversations, where that uh, with data about acceptability. And then, so we see that we have positive, uh, negative correlations, which is what we expect, right? So uh, less distance, uh, more, uh, whatever I said before. <laughs> and, and then for reading times, they are also a bit more moderate and some kind of low correlations, but they are still significant. And we can see that this is quite competitive with surprisal, which is the standard measure, right? And I will not go into details, but it's not only competitive with surprisal. Actually, we show also that sometimes it can be complementary to what surprisal is, uh, is, is capturing, right? So it looks from these results that this proposal for how to quantify effort where we are exploiting the generative power of LLMs does have some value for capturing uh, human processing, all right? Okay, so interim summary. I hope I can manage the second part, we'll see. So we've looked at LLMs. These are foundation models trained only on text, okay? And we ask whether it makes sense to evaluate them through the lens of human language processing. And we saw that they can reasonably well reproduce the variability in human production, uh, in human production, right? And we have seen also that it is possible to define a method to, um, uh, to quantify effort and that this method that exploits LLM generations by LLMs um, significantly predicts psychometric uh, measures of, uh, of human effort. Now in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, if possible, then I would like to tell you a little bit about some work with foundation models that don't look only at text, but that actually also have access to visual information that learn also from visual information, okay? Are you still having energy for this? Yes, okay. All right, then I'll go on. Okay, so um, it's quite accepted in computer science that uh, human conceptual knowledge, well, linguistic knowledge, but conceptual knowledge in general, semantic knowledge is grounded in our sensory motor experience, right? So we use language as well, and it's grounded in our language, but that this also includes information from our experience, from our perception, and so on, right? So to, and to get to grasp the concept of banana, then it's very difficult to maybe just grasp it from words in language, even though we get a lot of information, but it's clear that if we have some visual information and some ex experimental information, experience information, then we will, we will have a more, a richer, uh, a richer notion of what a banana is, right? Okay, so the, the, trend, um, the trend is to try to move from LLMs, that means only language, to foundation models that also use other types of information so that we have richer types of models. And we have seen, you may also have seen this, how now GPT-4, for example, also handles images and so on. So it is a general trend to move in this direction. And, uh, and then, yes, yeah, so these models, I won't give you a lot of details, but basically they are also pre-trained with lots of data, but now this data is not only many, many sentences, but also includes images and the training objective, usually it does include some sort of, uh, some sort of language modeling objective, but also some way of aligning uh, images and language, right? So there are many different multimodal models by now. So these are just a few of the current models. There are many different types and they use different training objectives and different types of things and so on. But as I was saying, typically they will combine some language modeling objective of predicting missing words that I was saying at the very beginning and some way of trying to find correlations between image regions and between N words. Right. Okay, so these models in principle have access to more information. They, they, it looks like they may be more in line with also how we learn language because we learn language in, in experiencing things in the world, right? So does it mean that they are better than language only models, that they are better than LLMs? 
Of course, it's very difficult to do a comparison because there are so many differences between them, but still, I think that we can, we can try, right? What we know about these models is that they have led to a lot of increases in performance for many types of applications and tasks, right? So applications such as automatic image captioning or answering questions about images or uh, searching an image from a sentence and so on, and even image generation, which I'm sure that you have seen these examples, right? So definitely there's been a boom, there's been an increase in performance by using these models, right? But we don't have a very good understanding of why there's been such an increase. So is it really because they contain more information because it's more, uh, it's richer? So what is it? What is it that uh, that leads to this kind of performance, right? And maybe we should also not be concerned only with how they improve things, but maybe we should try to understand a bit better what is the knowledge that they are learning in a more abstract way. So the question that, uh, that we've asked in a couple of studies is whether this kind of multimodal models learn representations of language that are aligned with multimodal knowledge. Right? And this is irrespectively of whether they give us gains in specific applications, specific technologies. All right? And we can look at this uh, at two different levels. So we call this intrinsic evaluation because we are not evaluating with respect to whether automatic image captioning is better, but just intrinsically whether the representations have properties that, that human representations have. So we can look at, this, at these two levels, lexical semantics, so the meaning of words or concepts, and also compositional semantics with linguist comp compositional semantics, which has to do with how the words are put together in sentences. So this has to do with uh, compositionality with sentence representation, right? So at these two levels, how aligned are the models with, uh, with human knowledge? Let's look first at words. So um, one way to, to get at, uh, at how we represent words is to look at semantic similarity judgments between words, right? So we may ask a bunch of humans to tell us how different pairs of words, how similar different pairs of words are, right? So, and, and for instance, we would like to see that man and person are relatively similar and dog and airplane are quite not dissimilar, right? And so, so humans may give us this kind of ratings here on the similarity of words. And then we can do the same with the representations that our multimodal models are learning, right? Or that our LLMs with only language are learning as well, right? So each word in the model will be represented by an embedding, by a, by a vector. Then we can calculate cosine, and that also gives us a measure of how similar these words are in the semantic space that the model is learning. So now we have a semantic space by the humans, a semantic space by the models, and again, we can compute correlation. Right? So this is a known method that has been using NLP extensively, but, uh, but only very recently, the comparisons between text-only LLMs and multimodal models has, has been tried. Okay, so that's the method. Then we do an, an experiment with a bunch of human semantic similarity data sets and a bunch of multimodal models, and then we also compare these multimodal models to text-only LLMs. So let's look at the results. These are the results of the correlations for one of these data sets of human similarity judgments. And what we can see here is looks pretty good, right? So all the models that are multimodally trained, that are trained with images and language, give higher correlations, and these are pretty high correlations over, zero, over, over 0 0.7, than uh, an LLM that is language only. Right? So it looks like it's in accordance with our expectations. They have more information. So it looks like it's pretty good, right? Okay, so that's good. But it turns out that when we look at all the data sets of these human similarity judgments, we don't always see this trend. And if we look at this one, for example, then it's the other way around. Then actually using only an LLM gives us better correlations and overall not, very, not, not as high as the other ones than using the multimodal models. So it doesn't work all across the board, right? So what is happening? What is the difference between these two data sets of human semantic similarity judgments? There might be a few differences, but one of them that we found is that these two data sets differ with respect to how concrete the words are that the humans are asked to, to rate according to similarity, 
right? My concrete, I mean things like, for example, donut and muffin are things that are very concrete because you can see them, because you can grasp them and so on. While we have other words in English that are very abstract, like freedom and dreams and so on, right? So some of the data sets have a lot of concrete words and some others have less concrete words and more abstract words. And it turns out that there is a clear trend in the ones where the words are more concrete, then the multimodal models do have an advantage and do better than the LLMs. And in the other ones, the LLMs do better, which is, well, interesting, right? So, so yeah, so it's not that there is a clear trend across the board, but I mean, there is a trend, but not an advantage across the board. The board. All right, so when it comes to lexical semantics, then yeah, there is an advantage for um, concrete words. So for, for concrete words, then these multimodal models can approximate quite well human similarity judgments. Now let's look briefly at the compositional semantics, right? So when we, what happens if we actually put words together, not just words as conceptual knowledge, right? How can we evaluate this? So we looked for inspiration, we looked at how the language abilities of children, of your chi young children are evaluated. And one way in which this is evaluated is by, for example, giving children a, a coloring book like that, and then to, to figure out whether they can understand constructions like the active passive voice in English, then they, they, the, the child maybe say, the blue monkey scratches the green monkey, and then ask to color things such that this is true. Right? And then the blue monkey is being scratched by the green monkey and asked to color things, right? So this is a way of showing whether the child can match a, the meaning of a given construction to, to a situation that depicts that, that meaning, right? And there are other possible constructions and so on, like coordination, relative clauses, and so on. So then we were wondering, okay, can we do a similar test for checking whether multimodal uh, foundation models actually understand the meaning of these sentences where we are putting the words together and, and, and they, they, they represent a certain meaning. So we created a data set for testing this kind of, this kind of question. So we created a data set with, with many of these items for these three types of constructions, active passive, coordination, and relative clause. And for a given image, there are four sentences associated with this image. Two of them are false and two of them are true. But the tricky bit is that they all contain the same words, right? So if the model is just good at representing the words as concepts in the abstract, it's not gonna be very good at doing this, right? It needs to know how the construction creates a meaning by putting the words together. So, all right, then we design an experimental setup like this. So we give, this, the, we give to the model the image, we give the model one of these sentences. Sometimes it will be true, sometimes it will be false. And then we ask the model to say whether it is true or false. And we have a bunch of models. Some of them uh, tend to this classification. Some of them are more generative models, in which case we have to prompt them. So we have to say, given this image, uh, is the sentence blah, 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 true or false? And the model will say true or false. Okay. Well, others will just be classification models. So what do you think is gonna happen? So what are they gonna be? So this is a binary class, right? It's true or false. So chance level is 50%. Any ideas? So how did you use the generative models for this uh, uh, matching task? So uh, with a prompt. So this, the, these are multimodal generative models. You can give it an, an image as an input. And then you have to write a prompt because the output of these models will always be language generated, right? So we, we just define a prompt that says, given this image and the sentence, and we just copied the sentence, uh, is it true or false of the image? And then, so some, we tested several models. And for example, some models were not able to always generate yes, no, or true, false. They would go, they would generate some weird stuff. And then we cannot evaluate, right? But uh, the more powerful models, they would always give you a yes or no, and then you can evaluate. Could you, uh, could you go back to the previous slides? Uh, so you're, you're talking about the discriminative model. Okay, from a machine learning point of view, I, I 
yeah, discriminative model is basically most of the case better than generative case, but uh, well, you might be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, should I show you the results because it's already five? So chance level is fifty percent, and these are the results that we got. So humans do the task very well. It's not a hundred percent because there might be a bit of noise in the data set. For example, sometimes maybe something is not fully visible in the image and there might be some uncertainty, right? So it's not hundred percent, but it's almost hundred percent. And all the other results, this is for active passive coordination relative close, they are all around chance level. So that was pretty disappointing. But you can see that the highest, even though it's very low, it's this blip two, which is a generative model. Right? It's also a more newer generation, right? The other ones came up a bit earlier. So yeah, it's, it's also not a fully open model. So it's difficult to, to dig a bit deeper on why that's the case. But, um, but that's, what, that's what we found, basically. Does it surprise you? Or? <laughs> Sorry, can I ask a question? So, so the number of parameters for the BERT and the BEEP yeah. lip is kind of similar, or like BLIP is much bigger? No, than it is bigger, yeah. Bigger. Okay. Yeah. 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 It so, is bigger. So the generative ones are bigger and the others are in fact quite different in their architecture. I see. And their training objective. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, I, when I, I chatted about this with some, with some people the other day, and then, you know, so I invite you to test to take this data set and test the newer models like GPT-4, for example, because I would be curious to see what happens. Right. Because this is pretty, this is pretty disappointing that these very basic sentences that preschool children can actually process cannot be processed here. Okay, so basically, uh, yeah, at around chance level, they cannot represent this kind of situational knowledge. Um, I'm not sure I have time to just go through this slide. I will just very, just very briefly say that um, the results on compositional semantics are bad, but the results on conceptual knowledge are more decent, right? So we think that there may still be possibilities for using these multimodal models to uh, investigate conceptual, conceptual knowledge as it is represented in the brain, right? So predicting human brain activity with LLMs is something that has been done, right? That has, has been done in, in computational neuroscience, but using multimodal models is something that is still very new. There are some results, like from this paper here, that show that if you use multimodal embeddings to predict high level visual cortex activation when people are looking at images, that then this gives you better results than if you use vision only uh, foundation models, right? So that having some linguistic information helps you to predict activation in visual processing areas. So what we would be interested in looking is the other way around, right? So it's whether if you have um, multimodal models and you want to predict activations when people are reading sentences, for example, does this multimodality give you an advantage for this more linguistic processing area than using only language embeddings? Right? So these are the subsequent sort of questions. This is work in progress, and I will not say any further. All right, so I'm finishing. I already gave the overview of the part on language only models. As for the multimodal, uh, the multimodal part. These were the results, right? Do they learn representations that are aligned with human linguistic in intuitions? Well, it depends. For conceptual knowledge, that's pretty good. For compositional knowledge, situational knowledge, it seems to be pretty bad. And as to whether we can use this information to help us figure out multimodality in the brain, then I think that we'll see. But it looks, it looks hopefully promising. So I just want to end by thanking you all and also all my team members that took part in these studies. And if you are interested in the details, then these are the publications um, from which this work comes in. Most of them actually to be presented next week at the MNLP. Thanks.